Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Overnight Russian missiles striking Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and multiple other places across the country, killing at least five people, destroying homes, and temporarily knocking out power for thousands of people. Ukrainian officials said the air raid began about 6 a.m. local time and lasted for about three hours. Defense Ministry there reports at least 20 drones in the air, 44 missiles fired, all Iranian-made. New warning over Chinese cyber attacks. Intelligence officials say hackers spent up to five years in U.S. networks in an effort to attack critical infrastructure. We're getting disturbing new details about China's efforts to secretly infiltrate and potentially attack our key infrastructure and literally our way of life. George, we've now learned that some of the covert operations by China began at least five years ago. Homeland Security, FBI and intelligence officials issued a new bulletin yesterday highlighting the Chinese hacking campaign we recently told our viewers about. The warning says China has shifted from a strategy of using hacking to commit economic espionage to a strategy of using hacking to disrupt how Americans go about their daily lives. The Chinese cyber warfare involves planting malware in computer networks, serving our electrical grid, oil and gas pipelines, our transportation systems, even our water treatment plants. Authorities say the plan would allow China to attack at a time of their choosing. FBI Director Ray is sounding the alarm, calling the concern about China, the threat of our generation, George. We are coming on the air on this Wednesday night following a number of breaking stories involving the U.S. military, including that drone strike in Iraq that the Pentagon says killed a high-ranking commander of Kataib Hezbollah. That is the Iranian-backed militia that is blamed for the death of three soldiers in Jordan. The United States says the commander killed is responsible for directly planning and participating in terrorist attacks against American forces in the Middle East. There have been 168 attacks on U.S. service members in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan since October. The strike targeted a single car on a busy street in the eastern part of the Iraqi capital. And this is the first time since the deaths of those soldiers that the United States has targeted a specific person after a major strike last week against buildings and weapons depots. The president has vowed that attacks on these militia groups will continue as long as the U.S. military in the region is threatened. The drone strike in downtown Baghdad engulfed a vehicle in flames, killing a senior commander of the largest Iranian-backed militia in Iraq and Syria, known as Kataib Hezbollah. U.S. officials said the nighttime strike was part of the retaliation ordered by President Biden after the drone attack which killed three American soldiers in Jordan. The target of tonight's strike was in charge of Kataib Hezbollah operations in Syria, just across the border from Jordan. And Pentagon officials had fingered Kataib Hezbollah as the most likely suspect. As the footprints of Kataib Hezbollah, um, but not making a final assessment on that. Retaliation for the Jordan attack began last Friday night with airstrikes against half a dozen locations in Iraq and Syria including ammunition dumps, which set off spectacular secondary explosions. More than 85 targets in all. We currently assess that we had good effects and that the strikes destroyed or functionally damaged more than 80 targets at the seven facilities. 
The effect that matters is whether these retaliatory strikes put an end to attacks against American troops. Since that Friday night strike, there have been two confirmed attacks, both in Syria, but no injuries to Americans. Jeremiah 8:11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. What does peace, peace, when there is no peace mean in Jeremiah 8:11? Jeremiah the prophet proclaimed that judgment was coming upon Jerusalem. However, Jeremiah was opposed by the king and the priests who did not want to hear his message. False prophets who claimed to speak for God also contradicted Jeremiah's message. Jeremiah proclaimed bloodshed, destruction, and judgment when Babylon conquered Jerusalem. The false prophets, on the other hand, said that the future of Jerusalem looked bright. Jerusalem could look forward to peace, not war. The phrase, peace, peace, when there is no peace, is found in Jeremiah 6.14 as well as Jeremiah 8.11. It is also found in Ezekiel 13.10 and 16. In all four places, it has the same meaning in the same historical context. Jeremiah was like a doctor delivering bad news to his patient, and his diagnosis was, unless drastic measures were taken, the patient would die. However, the false prophets gave a second opinion. Don't listen to Jeremiah, they said. You are going to be just fine. Instead of radical surgery and a drastic change of lifestyle, the priests and false prophets said a light bandage was all that was needed. The following passage is found in Jeremiah 6.13 and 14 and repeated in Jeremiah 8.10 and 11. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, Everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. When the priests and false prophets said, Peace, peace, they were denying that judgment was on the way. They were giving the people false assurances. The explicit assumption is that Jerusalem and Judah had not committed grievous sins and that God was not displeased with them. In fact, according to the false prophets, God was quite happy with his people and wanted to bless them. They promised peace, peace. Unfortunately, their promised peace would not come. The book of Jeremiah bears this out, and in the end, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon, just as God had said. People like to hear good news, and they do not want to hear that God's judgment is coming. The watchmen of our time have the job of delivering that bad news. God bore witness against the people to whom Isaiah was sent to minister, calling them rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction, as we read in Isaiah 39, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord. Such people have closed their ears to the word of the Lord and desire to hear only peace, even when there is no peace. They say to God's prophets, Give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. As we read in Isaiah 30, 10, and 11, Who says to the seers, Do not see, and to the prophets, Do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Just as Jeremiah the prophet proclaimed the judgment was coming upon Jerusalem, the watchmen of our time are warning of God's soon coming judgment on a wicked and unrepentant world. Are you listening? Secretary of State Antony Blinken's latest efforts to broker a new ceasefire and hostage release in the Israel-Hamas war hit a dead end today. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a counteroffer from Hamas, calling the terror group's demands delusional. As war rages on, if the U.S. was hoping Israel's Prime Minister would be in a negotiating mood, today would have been a disappointment. Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected a proposal by Hamas that includes demands for a 135-day ceasefire and the withdrawal of troops from Gaza in exchange for all the hostages. But peace and security require total victory over Hamas. 
We cannot accept anything else. And Netanyahu warned that while victory was close, it could still take months. Secretary of State Antony Blinken now on his fifth visit to the region appears to be going home empty-handed once again, despite his more positive tone. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. But peace and security require total victory over Hamas. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Daniel 9.26-27 and 27. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. Is the sudden destruction coming? And with it the rapture of the church? We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6, 2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6, 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly, a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church, the revealing of the Antichrist, and war? All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian, and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know Him, and the sooner the better. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, one of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Nothing can stop us, says presidential hopeful Anta Ngom. We're exercising our basic right, she adds. We have an appointment with the Senegalese people. Security forces prevent her from meeting party supporters. Then. She's arrested, accused of taking part in an illegal gathering. A masked officer is seen forcing her into a police van. Hours before the start of campaigning on Saturday, President Macky Sall canceled this month's presidential election. He says he's protecting democracy and isn't trying to extend his own term. But his decision is fueling widespread anger. In a district of Dakar named Liberty, protesters showing their defiance. The cancellation of the vote is seen as an injustice. Protesters say once again the powerful are robbing them of the chance 
to make their own future. We are in a country where people are mistreated. It's really tough for us. The world needs to understand this. This is a cry from the heart. I'm a struggling entrepreneur. I have a master's degree. I'm left selling coffee on the streets. There's no work. Jobs are given to those with political connections. We want work. We want to work for our country. Our time has come now. They're protesting what the opposition is calling a constitutional coup and block an avenue leading to the presidential palace. They're urging others to join their revolt. There's been running battles between protesters that have been throwing rocks and the police that have been responding by firing tear gas. They want to prevent this gathering to take place. But supporters of the opposition are determined to gather and to get their voices heard. The West African regional organization ECOWAS, the U.S. and France have all expressed concern and urged the announcement of an election date. You feel that it could burn at any point, and this is not what we deserve. What's been regarded as the most stable democracy in West Africa no longer seems so stable. Inside Senegal's parliament, opposition MPs are removed by police in riot gear. Some shout, democracy is under attack as they are pushed out. They had refused to sign a bill to delay the election and extend the president's time in power. Security forces using tactics from the street inside the National Assembly against elected members of parliament. The motion to delay the election by nine months effectively extending the president's mandate is passed nearly unanimously after hours of heated debate. What has just been voted is unprecedented in Senegal's history. It's a constitutional coup because Article 103 of the Constitution says clearly the mandate of the head of state cannot be extended or revised. From the suburbs to the edge of parliament, protests are getting louder and coming closer to the presidential palace. The government has restricted mobile internet access. Some local media outlets have been taken off air. Authorities say they are stopping the spread of hateful and divisive content. Rights groups say it's a violation of fundamental rights. Two presidential candidates are appealing to the Constitutional Council to intervene. The Constitutional Council has the responsibility to take decisions that will bring calm to the country and save our nation from this somber period, which is really an insult to the Senegalese people. The police intervene, preventing the candidates from talking. Sal says the elections were cancelled because members of that council, which is meant to draw the list of candidates, are suspected of taking bribes. He says the electoral process has lost credibility, and a delay will allow time to rebuild trust in the country's institutions. Protesting Haitians have given Prime Minister Ariel Henry until Wednesday to resign, saying his unelected government has done nothing to protect them from a devastating surge in gang violence. Insecurity, Insecurity is everywhere. The roads are destroyed. No one can go on with their daily life. Everyone should be able to have a higher living standard because our country is the mother of freedom. Local media reported that this week's protests have paralyzed public transports and shut down banks and schools in northern and southern Haiti. Clashes with police will not deter the protests, says opposition politician Jean-Charles Moïse. Attacks from the police only make us more determined. If Ariel Henry does not leave, we'll continue to protest. Human Rights Watch recently estimated that more than 300,000 people were internally displaced in Haiti and nearly half of the population is going hungry as rival gangs indiscriminately kill, rape, kidnap and loot as they vie for territory. The gangs have expanded their control across most of the capital and nearby areas, filling a security vacuum that was left after the assassination of the country's last president, Jovenel Moïse, in 2021. There have been a number of attacks in Pakistan this morning as millions head to the polls to vote in the country's general election. Mobile phone services have 
have been temporarily suspended, and some land borders have been closed following two deadly blasts yesterday that killed dozens of people. Polls have now closed in Pakistan's national elections amidst escalating militant attacks and allegations of electoral misconduct, raising concerns about the integrity of the vote in a country with 128 million eligible voters. Now, as we've been saying, the Pakistani government has already suspended cell phone services, citing the need to, quote, preserve order amidst uh, anticipated unrest but critics say the communications blackout is really just an attempt at suppressing the vote. Security, meanwhile, is a very serious concern. At least seven officers were killed in two separate attacks targeting election security today, while the political offices in southwestern Pakistan were also targeted in bomb attacks yesterday, killing at least 30 people. Now, across Pakistan, there is a widely held view that the military is pulling the strings in this election, with three-time former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif as their favored candidate it, while former Prime Minister Imran Khan, arguably the most popular politician in Pakistan, has been jailed and his political party effectively gutted by the military-led establishment. In fact, just days before today's vote, he was sentenced to 10 years for leaking state secrets, 14 for corruption, and 7 for a, quote, illegal marriage. Charges, he says, are all politically motivated. Now, Emory, I voted on Pakistan for years, a country which for around half of its existence has been under military rule. And I think it's safe to say that this is the least credible election mm. in Pakistan's history. And whatever the outcome, the incoming government will have to confront formidable challenges, including worsening, worsening security, a migration crisis, and addressing severe economic challenges, which has made life a misery for so many in the nuclear armed nation, Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one-world government. He will control a one-world religion. He will control a one-world monetary system, known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, 
and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Now, just days ahead of Carnival, with millions of tourists expected, Brazil is on high alert amid a surge in cases of dengue fever. The cities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo have now both declared public health emergencies and have opened dedicated centres to treating people who may be infected. With Brazilian health services already under strain, field hospitals have sprung up in the capital and other cities across the country amid an outbreak of mosquito-borne dengue fever. I have been feeling this pain for four days. A lot of pain in my body, pain in my eyes. I can't even raise my head because I feel like I'm going to faint. Most cases of dengue in humans are mild, but some people develop a severe form and require hospitalization. In Rio de Janeiro, the outbreak isn't expected to derail Carnival, which officially starts Friday evening, but it has prompted special measures in hopes of containing the illness. The number of cases in Brazil since January 1st is four times higher than the same period last year, ahead of the launch of a free vaccination campaign, the first of its kind in the world. Priority will be given to children aged 10 to 14, the group with the highest number of hospitalizations. The southern summer months typically bring hot and humid conditions ideal for mosquitoes to breed. But authorities have also pointed to the record temperatures at the end of last year as a major factor behind the spread. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21:11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Back here at home, the CDC is warning about the rise in measles infections in the U.S. There have been 23 reported cases since December, mostly in children who have not been vaccinated. In a CBS News investigation, correspondent Stephen Stock analyzed vaccination rates across the country, and he found that hundreds of thousands of children are at risk of getting deathly ill. Clark County, Washington made national news in 2019 with a measles outbreak that lasted for months. It started with one case, then came another, in all 71 measles cases before it was over. We found nationwide the share of unvaccinated kindergartners grew significantly in the last three years. In the 19 states where we analyzed data, the vaccination rates are so low, at least 8,595 schools are now at risk of a measles outbreak. That's at least 800,000 students. Across the country here in New York City, they had their own measles outbreak in 2019. 649 people in all. Dozens had to be hospitalized. City of New York. The city's public health commissioner says while more people in New York City got vaccinated because of the outbreak, the numbers have been declining ever since. The reason rates are down is complicated. Six different experts point to everything from political influences to fear of vaccines, mistrust in government to misinformation. At least nine deaths are now being blamed on the storms that slammed California this week. Three days of record rainfall triggered hundreds of mudslides damaging homes across the state. CBS's Carter Evans shows us the massive cleanup has only just begun. As L.A. finally starts to dry out, they're digging out from a massive amount of mud that has inundated the region. The numbers are remarkable. Since the beginning of the year, Los Angeles has recorded nearly twice the amount of rainfall as Seattle, more than six times what Miami has received, a foot of rain in L.A., much of it just in the last three days. That's what makes the cleanup so daunting. Just since Sunday, more than 500 mudslides and 400 trees uprooted. 
The damage stretching from the hillsides to the beaches. These apartment buildings now hang precariously over the shoreline near Santa Barbara after a cliff gave way. East of LA, this woman's mother survived a major slide yesterday morning. She was just like, oh my God, the hill's coming down, the hill's coming down. We have an amount of rain before, but not as bad. In this storm, Jesus Barone's situation is all too typical. He took us through his house. No power. It actually looked okay until we got here. Oh my gosh. So it, it's not like it even came through, it's not like it even came through the window here. It came through the wall. It came through the wall, as you can see. Yes, it took down the studs, it took down everything. Yes. Wow. This is what it looks like from the backyard. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. More rain is on the way, and that's bad news for people who live in hillside communities where the threat of even more mudslides is very real. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes all at record levels of frequency and intensity just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. It was the figure set as a limit, 1.5 degrees Celsius. When world leaders met in 2015 in Paris, they vowed to do everything they could so the average global temperature did not go 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial temperatures and settle on that high level. But in the past 12 months, they did just that. This, for example, was what January looked like in Spain. It's the rate of increase which we should emphasize, this is unprecedented. The rate of change with time has never occurred except for, you know, very small t uh, times when you know, the asteroid hit the Earth. Scientists believe that once temperatures hit this threshold and stay at that level, uncontrollable weather events become more common. Deadly heat, droughts, and also rising sea levels, storms, and flooding. Once temperatures go 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels, the consequences can be irreversible. But scientists say it's not too late. Significant change occurs when this global heat lasts several decades. The only way to prevent this is to cut down greenhouse gas emissions. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather. And yet, it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. 
Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Tourists were evacuated from a popular resort in Iceland this morning when a volcano erupted for the third time since December. The eruption sent lava bursting up into the air. It's happening just a few miles from a scenic fishing village where an earlier eruption destroyed several homes. Officials say that at this point, the lava poses no threat to the town or a major power plant in that area. It's not expected to have any impact on air travel. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it. But something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever. And earthquakes are going crazy. And nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption as we read in Revelation 8.8. 8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Luke 21.26-28 Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready!
Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.